I'm delighted to introduce uh, Eugene Cho, Reverend Eugene Cho. Uh, he's my successor at Bread for the World. So he's a very important person in my life and in my prayers. I uh, pray for him that, uh, and for his family. <clears throat> um, he does have a remarkable story and I'll try to tell a little bit of that, Eugene. Uh, um, his family went through the deprivations of the partition of Korea. So they weren't completely strangers to hunger. Uh, he himself was uh, six years old when his family then immigrated, emigrated to the United States. And <laughs> I've been struck by the, he told me once that the first time he ever saw a white person was when he arrived at the age of six in San Francisco airport. <laughs> I thought, whoa, this is different. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, um, he studied at UC Berkeley or UC Davis and uh, uh, went through a conversion experience there, became an evangelical Protestant. Uh, had, his family had had connections to the church, but he had a conversion experience and uh, changed him. And he then uh, got his MDiv at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. He decided to uh, go to Korea and pastor a church there. And in the process, he also uh, found his wife, Minhee, and uh, married her. And they came, then they felt called to come back and uh, start a church. So they moved to Seattle um, and found, founded what became Quest Church. They started with nobody and <laughs> And then uh, that church has grown into a big, uh, huge church, a mega church. It's a really interesting, I've never been there, but uh, it's an evangelical church, multiracial, committed to social justice. Uh, and he stayed there a long time, had a lot of, uh, had a big impact there. Then he also uh, developed an online ministry. Is uh, He's one of the, most widely followed uh, Christian influencers, I guess you call it, in the country. Uh, he's a, he's also a conference speaker, spoke at conferences in um, all across this country and also around the world. And then it was on a trip to Myanmar. Uh, one of our students, Eugene, is A.A. A. Wynn, who's uh, from way up in, a, in the corner of Myanmar, where it borders uh, Laos, China, and Thailand. And, uh, but uh, Eugene on a trip to uh, Myanmar, uh, he and his wife, Min, he uh, met with a, a group of people who were from an ethnic group and uh, were just in terrible straits, really difficult times. And uh, they decided um, that they needed to do some things to help people in those situations. So they, they gave up their wages for a year and used that money to start um, uh, an assistance organization called One Day's Wages. And One Day's Wages asks people to give up one day's wage to wages to uh, help people in uh, developing countries with de mostly, I think it's small scale development projects for community groups in Asia and the Middle East. I, I don't know if I've got that quite right, but that's what I think. And then um, he stepped down from Quest Church in 2018. And, uh, and then the board of Bread for the World found him. And I mean, we knew about him, but uh, I think they had a hard time convincing him that he should move from Seattle to Washington, DC. Also, I was really touched by the fact that first his parents didn't wanna move from Seattle. And so um, as a good Korean man, he uh, thought, well, that nixes the possibility of moving to DC. If my parents don't wanna move, I have to, I shouldn't move, I don't wanna move. Um, but then they changed their mind. And uh, so <laughs> although he's managed to not move to DC yet because of the pandemic and also his son is, one of his sons is finishing high school. Uh, so, um, 
but he's taken over at Bread for the World. Clearly, this is, a, you know, I was there a long time. My predecessor was there a long time. So he's the third uh, president of Bread for the World and it's 47 years of organizational life. Uh, the, board, the board thought it was time for uh, generational change and that's what we're getting. Uh, Eugene, uh, clearly a very different person than I am. And he comes to, comes to the work of Bread for the World with fresh eyes, fresh ideas about uh, how to achieve its mission. Its mission is to, um, it's a collective Christian voice uh, urging our nation's elected leaders to do their part to end hunger. But um, the question is, how do you do that now? What's the most effective use of resources? How do you mobilize uh, Christian people and churches to be effective in that mission in today's environment? And, uh, and then what should you push for? What, what are the changes that you can get? That, uh, uh, so anyway, on, on both those things, he's taking a fresh look at things and making some big changes. And so I, I thought it'd be really interesting to hear uh, what, uh, what he's thinking and what they're doing uh, in, as he, uh, now you've been eight months, uh, the president of Bread for the World. So he is, uh, he's definitely uh, moving in new directions. And I look forward to listening, Eugene, to, to what you're thinking and doing now. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a joy and a pleasure. Not quite what we probably all imagined, staring at each other's eyes for the next couple hours, but... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully at some point this will come to an end. Uh, I just had the opportunity to take my first dosage or first dose of a vaccine. Feels weird to be categorized as 1B. I guess it's the fresh benefits of being age 50. Um, <laughs> you know, age 50. And, um, and uh, David, I just also wanna ask you um, specifically not to, not to grade my, 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 my short chat. I hope, uh, I'm a guest, <laughs> not a student, so don't grade me. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, first of all, it's really a joy and a pleasure to, to spend some time with you all. And um, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, that's really, as the song goes, where I left my heart. Um, immigrated there when I was six years old and spent uh, pretty much my entire adult life before moving over to New Jersey for seminary. And so when I go visit the Bay Area, uh, visiting Berkeley is also one of my favorite places to go as well. Um, let me just kind of give you a quick roadmap of how we'll spend uh, the next 30, 40 minutes. And then I think afterwards we'll have some Q&A time. And then I think you have your second portion. But, uh, you know, I've been tasked with the invitation to just share a bit about Bread for the World, about my vision for Bread for the World. Um, I don't mean to hijack uh, or to take this time on a different route, but just for a couple of minutes, uh, you know, because to be honest with you, my mind and my heart uh, today and throughout this week has been scattered uh, and in some ways feeling shattered by what has transpired in Atlanta. Um, yeah. The morning of that event, uh, we had two churches here in Seattle vandalized by racist hate comments. Um, and just yesterday, a friend of mine sent me a video of like children at a playground being accosted uh, by an older white American man with a flag and a Trump flag um, telling these kids to go back to China. This is in Seattle. And so, you know, my heart has just been really just heavy uh, and, and, and broken and shattered. And I just wanted to read something very uh, quickly, it's something that I wrote on my on my Facebook. Um, the temptation for both media and consumers is to focus on the crime and the perpetrator. We seek to do a collective forensic analysis on the person's life, motives, words, and actions, even if we don't want to. I've tried so hard not to look at news this week, but storylines, images, and pictures keep sliding to my attention. This is why we have to be pursuant of centering the victims. He may be the center of the story, but he does not have to be the center of our attention. We have to seek to humanize the victims, pursue their stories, know their names, say their names, mourn their lives, stop Asian hate, protect Asian women, 
honor the elders, pray for their families and their loved ones. That's what we should all be trying to do, piece glimpses of their stories and backgrounds, families and dreams. In doing so, it becomes just a little more personal. And I've learned that change won't happen unless it becomes personal to us, all of us. So with that in mind, I just wanna briefly uh, just say their names if you don't mind. Uh, and I may be not saying all of these as accurately as I want to. Zhao Jie Tan is 49 years old, a spa owner, one daughter. Dao Yu Feng, 44. Chen Zheng Kim Grant, 51, a single mom of two boys. Sun Cha Kim was 69. Sun Park was 74. Young A Yu was 63. Elena Yaun was 33, a mom of a 13-year-old and an eight-month-old, and Paul Andre Michels, 54 years old. So I just want to take a moment of just silence, and then um, I'll go ahead and just share. Thanks so much again for offering me just that opportunity to, to do that. I know all of you have been mourning in our own respective ways. I'm not sure how much uh, of Brett's story uh, David has shared with you. I mean, I am the new president, but uh, David is Mr. Bread. He will always be Mr. Bread. He is his, uh, you probably don't know this and, and he shouldn't. Uh, and I, I say this not in an awkward way, because he's such an humble person. Uh, but uh, you know, part of the reason why Brett has had so much influence around the country and on Capitol Hill, I think is the long, faithful, steadfast, persistent leadership of David on Capitol Hill. When you've been around for 30 years and you keep showing up every single day, there's a certain power to that. And in many ways, that's really the nature and the mission of Bread for the World this collective Christian voice advocating our leaders in our nation um, to help end hunger both in our nation and around the world. It began in October, 1972, according to uh, some of the books that you may have been introduced to, Art Simon, the first president and founder. He shares a little bit of that story of how a group of seven Catholics and seven Protestants uh, I mean, even that in itself back then and even today says something that Catholics and Protestants chose to gather together. A part of me wonders if there was an eighth Catholic or an eighth Protestant, but they had to make sure it was even and one of them got kicked off. But that's just me. I'm not, I can't verify it, but seven Catholics, seven Protestants, and they began to discuss uh, problems, issues impacting um, their people, their church, their neighborhoods, their communities. And I think this is so important that we understand our theology should never be simply reduced to the walls of our church or to our pulpits. It has to really come from people on the ground, in the streets. That's where stories, I think, are authentic and genuine and powerful. In some ways, it's the subversive nature of the gospel, the kingdom of God, where power often goes to the haves, to, the, um, uh, to those who have titles and power and influence. And yet we know that Jesus relinquishes the power and the glory of heaven to come to earth, consumed by flesh and bone. Eugene Peterson, an author who wrote a translation of the Bible called The Message, uh, in John chapter one, there's a verse, verse eight, where it says, Jesus moved into the neighborhood. And that's always been a powerful part, I think, of this incarnational theology. So, so I think it's really important that you understand as influential as Bread for the World is on Capitol Hill, uh, and many people understand the credibility of the organization, the origin of our story really matters. And so he got together with these pastors and they began to, again, Think about not just direct service, because we all know there are many ways to help end hunger. Anyone that tells you there's only one way, uh, that's just, um, I'd say respectfully, it's very naive 
Uh, there are many ways. So even at Bread for the World, we do exclusively all the nuances of policy work, helping to shape programs and policies, but we have to ourselves acknowledge it's not the only way to end hunger. We think it's a very significant way and actually something that often gets ignored in the capital C church in our Christian theology or imagination. So they began to think about ways to help shape policy. And so in May 1974, with no staff and virtually no money, uh, they launched Bread for the World as a national movement. And it's been growing steadily ever since building not so much on like snazzy promotional campaigns, but again, faithful, steadfast, grassroots, effective work. Uh, the original organizing committee believed that even a small group of concerned citizens in each congressional district could have enormous influence on national decisions because as you know, members of Congress listen when voters from their own states and districts speak up. So to give you an example of this, I won't mention the specific Senator or from the state that he's in, but I was in a, a call, a Zoom call uh, several months ago, probably in my second or third month of my, of my new chapter. There was maybe eight or nine presidents and CEOs of various organizations, uh, direct reliefs, couple advocacy. I mean, there were, you know, uh, the who's who of like NGOs, if you will. Uh, when it was my turn to share and actually throughout the whole thing, this particular Senator, I didn't feel like he was really paying attention. Now I know it's hard on Zoom calls when you're on calls regularly to stay engaged, but I could tell he was fidgeting with letters and notes and his assistants were talking to him on the side. He was looking off, probably playing Tetris on his cell phone. I'm not quite sure. But I could tell he was not engaged or maybe not impressed, maybe both. But this is what I'll never forget. The moment I specifically told him the actual number of bread members in his specific district, he looked at me, he looked at the camera and I could just tell he kind of sat up a little bit. And in a sense, that's part of the strength of bread for the world is that we understand we've got these politicians and policymakers that are making significant decisions. They have this capacity of power, but at the end of the day, we wanna keep reminding people that we have a voice and we have to exercise that voice, acknowledging that not every single politician or any party or platform fully encapsulate certainly one's individual views, but what we would deem to be the kingdom of God, the ethics of the kingdom imagination as articulated in the Beatitudes. Now, we should just even acknowledge in a small Zoom room like this, we are not gonna agree on probably anything, but I would like to say, and that this is probably something that David shaped at Bread, and it's a, a, a phrase that we often say at Bread right now, is that hunger should never be a partisan issue. We may disagree on how to go about fighting and ending hunger, but it shouldn't be a partisan issue. And you know that something is somewhat broken or jaded because oftentimes it's devolved into a, a partisan issue or people voting along partisan lines. So again, I just wanna go back to some of the, uh, uh, the origins of it. As I shared earlier, bread for the world does not engage in direct relief efforts. It's a real big challenge because you know, to our donors, there are some people that think we're actually doing direct relief. And so it doesn't surprise me that in the past year with such enormous financial challenges, to so many people in the nation, we had one of our most tremendous giving years this past year, which is great. I think part of it is because people have heard that we're in a hunger crisis. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if some people thought that we were also doing direct relief efforts. The example that I give to folks is that we try to do work upstream, engaging, educating, mobilizing, analysis, we do work upstream on the river, 
trying to not just think about how to feed people with fish. You, I know I'm sure you're familiar with that analogy. We're not just teaching people how to feed fish, but also trying to ask the questions, who actually has access to the water and the lake and the river? Is there equity and is there justice? Is there contamination in certain parts of the river? Uh, again, trying to work upstream so that organizations and agencies who do direct relief work are able to reap the benefits of our shared work along with our coalition partners and what have you. So this is good, but it's also a challenge. Like we do advocacy work 365 days out of a year. Uh, the challenge is for some people, because advocacy, they can't help connect those dots. But again, as David probably shared with you, and as each of you know, policy has such a powerful ability to enact an exact change. What I often tell people is that I'm not a big fan of politics, which is why I'm, I'm struggling a little bit in my job right now, because I'm constantly engaging politicians and members of Congress. But politics matter because politics shape policies that ultimately impact people. Theologically, we know that regardless of your theological lens, any and every time you read the scriptures, God loves people. And I think it's also fair to say that God has a particular inclination towards those who are vulnerable and marginalized in our community and society. Another reason why I think advocacy matters so much is because we acknowledge that everybody has a voice, but not everyone is heard. In some ways, that in itself is a description of an unjust system. So everybody has a voice, but not everyone is heard. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me right now. I couldn't find my notes, but Last week, I was speaking to about 100 or so members of BREAD in Indiana. Uh, and they're probably one of our stronger constituents there in terms of their grassroots. And you know, I was just breaking down the amount of money spent on lobbying here in the United States. Uh, just think about it. You can just guess in your own mind. Like, Think about the number one sector where money is spent in lobbying in the United States. Um, it's a rhetorical question, just guess in your own head. You can put it in this uh, chat message if, you, if you're interested. I have no prize for you. But by a ton, just by a ton, it starts with a P, pharmaceuticals. I mean, some of you are nodding your head because you probably knew. I mean, but it's not the graph, the, the charts that you see, it's not even close. And then obviously you also have just individual companies that spend hundreds of millions of dollars on lobbying. I believe last year, the single largest company in terms of amount of money spent on lobbying, you can guess in your head, it makes sense to me, was Facebook because of all the things that are going on with laws around, around social media and what have you exactly $3.5 billion per year on lobbying and it's continuing to grow. So in the middle of that, I'm not actually suggesting that that's not entirely bad, but again, it then goes to show that it's those who are powerful and those who have resources are then being heard. Don't let me go into the whole NRA conversation, right? So when we're talking about issues of poverty, and all the complex interlocking aspects of poverty, and there are many interlocking aspects of it, that's where Bread for the World in its origin and as it's evolved through Art Simon's leadership, David Beckman's leadership, and hopefully through my leadership, we're trying to say, how do we um, continue to speak up and advocate uh, for the end of hunger through the shaping of programs and policies? So you fast forward 45 years, fast forward 45 years, Bread now has connections in every single 435 congressional districts in the United States. That's pretty amazing. Kudos to David and 
again, to art for, again, building up the foundations of those things. And I know this isn't meant to be an advertisement, but we would love your voice to come join us at Bread for the World. Uh, I, I want to walk away having at least one, two, three, four, about eight more advocates that would join Bread for the World. Now, again, our impact comes from a combination of this persistent, consistent voice across the United States, urging Congress to end hunger, coupled with highly personalized advocacy, usually from, yes, grassroots, everyday member, leader activists, I hate to say it, influentials, like we have to utilize all of it. We use everyday members of Congress, but we're also looking at key relationships targeting leader activists, influentials at critical points in the legislative cycle, uh, in the districts and states of targeted members of Congress, and the list goes on. So the impacts of the government policies and programs that Brett has fought over the last 45 years and I just wanna pause and say, we don't do this alone. We always work in collaboration or a coalition with other people. It's good, but it's also challenging because bread can't necessarily take exclusive credit for any one singular victory. And it makes sense that you have to work in coalition because the US government is such a behemoth that it really requires this um, groundswell of many voices and organization. So just to give you a little glimpse of some of the stuff that Bread has worked on. So I thought in my time, I would share with you a little bit about achievements history, maybe this past year, uh, particularly the past seven, eight months. And then maybe I'll just share with you a little bit about a couple examples of bipartisan efforts, which is so hard and so challenging. Uh, in its history, some of the highlights, and I'm sure even after I get off the call, David can probably speak at length about some of the, the historical achievements. In the first decade of the century, the U.S. Congress tripled poverty-focused development assistance from $7.5 billion. I just want to accentuate that just in case the audio might not be clear. $7.5 billion dollars in the fiscal year 2000. And by the time we hit 2010, that grew to $22 billion. Okay. As a taxpayer, that gives me a lot of, um, a bit more joy uh, among decisions that I don't always entirely agree with, especially when you acknowledge both in our nation, but around the world. I mean, Probably 15, 20, 20 years ago, there was probably an average of 40,000 children under the age of five who died every single day because of the complexities of hunger. That's been reduced to about 12 to 13,000 and still too much and sadly gone up over the past year because of the secondary issues of COVID. The uh, US aid to Africa has more than quadrupled and funding for agriculture and rural infrastructure increased tenfold. I can guarantee you those things would not have happened without persistent advocacy. Okay. Domestic nutrition programs, federal food assistance, food assistance to needy families increased in the first decade of the century and in the second decade they were repeatedly protected from trillions of dollars in proposed cuts. Uh, David can share more with you at a different time if he hasn't already. It's not my desire to villainize or demonize uh, the past administration. We're always gonna have disagreements with every administration, but there were, again, so many proposed cuts to critical funding to support those who are experiencing hunger and poverty, and had it not been for Bread for the World, for the Circle of Protection, for our co uh, coalitions, those cuts would have taken place. Uh, there were reforms in the U.S. Farm Bill providing greater opportunity for struggling families in rural Americas and rural areas of the developing world. So oftentimes, when we think about hunger, we have to get rid of some of the um, the assumptions that we may have. It is true 
that there are communities that are more deeply impacted because of all the challenges around hunger, including systemic hunger as a result of policies and programs, right? So it's not just a heart issue, but it also is a systemic issue. And so even in this past year, because of COVID, we learned that 40% of black and brown families with children right now are having a difficult time putting food on the table right now. At the same time, we have to make sure that we understand hunger impacts nearly every single segment. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 13 of the poorest states with the highest rates of hunger actually happen to be quote unquote red states, which is the reason why it flusters us when we're sometimes met with um, uh, resistance. Uh, we're met with resistance uh, in some of our conversations. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of this past year, the American Rescue Plan, uh, while Bread's policy is not to speak on all parts of the plan or the bill, because that's not our role. In fact, I don't even know all the things that are part of the rescue plan, but we're focusing on and advocating for elements of it that speak again to those who experience hunger. But we do know that it is one of the most impactful policy uh, plans, uh, probably in the last 20 years, according to some, if not longer. Um, how is that being done? Uh, the extensions of the 15% increase to SNAP, the pandemic unemployment insurance programs, debt relief for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, particularly Black, Latino, Indigenous, and others, robust funding for the international COVID-19 response, $11.5 billion were in the recent American Rescue Plan. If you were to add that 11.5 to about four and a half in the previous one and 2.5 in the initial one, that's over $18 billion, which is close to the $20 billion that we have been as a coalition, including Bread for the World, advocating for. Again, sometimes when you share these numbers, there's, they sound really dizzying in many ways. So for me, I have to constantly remember uh, three experiences because it has to be personal. I have to remember the story of my parents growing up in what is now called North Korea. My father eating or sharing stories of having to pull out grass from the ground to consume it to satisfy hunger pangs. If you hear and learn about some of the stories of the poor around the world, they'll share with you stories about, about cookies made of dirt and grass as an example, which is so painful to hear. And it's not healthy, but these so-called dirt cookies actually are sold for very cheap prices, but they're sold to those who are poor to help satisfy hunger pangs. So, when I think about and talk to you about these policies and these numbers, for me and for all of us, we have to realize we can't just be grass tops, policy wonk individuals. It really has to become personal for us in some ways. We have to be both pastoral, prophetic, practical, but also have it be personal. I'm also remembering a time about 21 years ago when my wife and I began to start this church called Quest Church. And in the first year, we couldn't get it off the ground. It was tremendously challenging. And so as a result, uh, we were faced with a season of unemployment and we had left a church to plant this church and things just didn't turn out. And I learned very quickly that a master's of divinity degree uh, is pretty useless to society. I don't wanna scare any of you, but uh, you made a bad decision. If you need to go to computer science, you can still do it, unless you feel called, then I can't say anything. But it was actually a really discouraging time. Uh, I'm not even joking. Got rejected by McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, uh, Toys R Us, because they were just unsure what to do with a candidate with a Master's of Divinity degree. So eventually I landed a job as a janitor. And I share that not to make it sound like that job was beneath me. It was hard because 
it was the last thing on my mind. It wasn't part of my Excel sheet to do on planning this church. And so for a year worked as the janitor at a store called Barnes and Noble in Linwood, Washington, this big bookstore. Uh, if I can boast for a second, I truly believe that Barnes and Noble was the cleanest Barnes and Noble in the country, but that's just me. But it was really hard, really, really hard working six to nine in the morning alone at a 40,000 square foot warehouse. But I think God did something in me. Um, and that's a different, different story, different talk. But the reason why I bring that up was, was because at that moment, I, because of my circumstances, thankfully, because I was introduced to a social worker who introduced me to something called the Woman Infant Children Program. The WIC program, I don't wanna sound dramatic. I don't know where we would have been had it not been for that safety net. And so constantly, I think this nation as a whole including at times members of Congress, there is an indignation towards those who are quote unquote poor. And so part of policy work isn't just data and analysis, is how do we use data and analysis to help shape a more authentic narrative and story, right? The assumption that all poor people are lazy and therefore are abusing the welfare system is simply an assault on the dignity of people that experience hunger and poverty. We know by data, for example, that SNAP is one of the most effective programs, effective both in terms of how it comes alongside those who experience hunger, but in terms of, I think, its uh, ability uh, that, that it's not being abused. Uh, that's so important. So part of my vision for Bread is as we continue to do policy work, analysis, grassroots mobilizing, is really acknowledging that there is a battle for storytelling, uh, a battle for narrative. And how do we shape that in a way that doesn't embellish, but tries to, again, dignify every single human being that's experiencing hunger and poverty. Uh, we've done some work around expanding and extended availability for something called the pandemic EBT. Uh, when I think about that, I think about families in my church who I know uh, receive the benefits of pandemic EBT, uh, protected food aid this past year, uh, immediate access to SNAP even for formerly incarcerated individuals in California. I mean, this is just a little glimpse of some of the big picture, but also some of the more specific things that again, our team has sought to advocate for. Really hard, really challenging. It's been the toughest year of my life this past year for lots of reasons, um, for lots of reasons. I had an uncle pass away because of COVID. Um, our children have been impacted. I have a child with uh, a chronic illness. And so she's been experiencing a lot of anxiety this past year. Um, and the, just the uh, incredulous skyrocketing surge of anti-hate, anti-Asian hate and racism. You guys are in Berkeley. And so, you know, because in your backyard of Oakland and San Francisco, this is right there. And it's also right here in San Francisco, uh, in Seattle as well. Uh, this is a crazy story. My 85-year-old father, you know, he's an amazing person. Uh, I, I love him to death. Uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, um, <laughs> he, uh, he just shocked me, uh, blew me away because he insisted, my 85-year-old father insisted on buying a gun. And it just just tore me up and I had to convince him that that was ridiculous. And the crazy part of that conversation is that as I said that a part of me in my brain said, maybe he should. And the fact that I even thought that, I think details how uh, we live in a very broken world and we have a lot of work to do. Just for the sake of time, 
I thought maybe what I would do is just share a little bit about some of our bipartisan work. Because we get this question a lot and through Art and David, a stated mission of Bread for the World is that we are a nonpartisan organization acknowledging that everyone's got their inclinations. But Bread for the World, we seek to be a nonpartisan organization working in bipartisan efforts. And we have a reputation uh, on Capitol Hill in DC of being one of the more reputable, credible bipartisan organizations, uh, including our government relations director, Heather Valentine, who um, just has tremendous influence because of her years working uh, on, with staffers and with members of the Republican Party. But here are some examples of some bipartisan policies. Um, so, so maybe step back one bit. How do we do this? I think our language matters. Um, uh, even if I may have an inclination towards using certain phrases, as an organization, we try to be very careful with our language. For me, that makes sense because on some things, if you know that you need members of the GOP to sign on, then you've got to speak to their heart and to their language. I think sometimes in our desire to raise our fist and to appear a certain way, and that's just me. You know, I, my, my kids think I'm soft. You know, I've got a 22-year-old and a 20-year-old, and they're both very actively engaged. My son is 18 years old. But I think there's wisdom in how you craft your language and how you speak with people. So language is one way that we do this. Uh, but representation, some of our staffers uh, are belong to the Republican Party, our board of directors. We have a 40 person plus board. Pause for some sympathy for Eugene. So we have a 40% 40 person plus board, but we have two members, each of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as representatives and advisors on our board. And they've been very, very helpful and influential as well. So those are some ways that we've been able to build that. But just to give you some examples internationally, it's been said that Republicans are much more favorable and strong on international aid. And with domestic, uh, it's the Democrats who tend to be stronger in those ways. And so again, we're trying to bring people together. Global nutrition, the Senate and the House, this is, this is bread for the world. We did this. Bread for the world, passed resolutions in 2019 and last year in December 2020, it had just broad, the Senate global nutrition resolution was uh, SR 260 passed with 41 co-sponsors. The House Global Nutrition Resolution, HR 189, passed with 154 co-sponsors. It was one of the most broad bipartisan resolutions of this past year. Now, I get it. Some people are not impressed. They're non-binding resolutions, so it doesn't feel major. But this is the first time this kind of thing has been written down and signed by so large and obviously bipartisan group. Here's our strategy. We got them to sign on to these resolutions. Now we go back to them and we're basically asking them to deposit $300 million in the global nutrition, in the global nutrition account. And we can now say, hey, you signed the resolution Let's follow that up with putting our money where our signature is. That's an example. Foreign assistance reform, very bipartisan. Global Food Security Act, bipartisan. Food aid, uh, very bipartisan, including Food for Peace, the largest food aid program, which began in the 1950s approximately 5 billion people in 150 countries have benefited from American generosity and compassion. Like if we wanna talk about make America great again, I, that is a way that we can lead. Domestically, the WIC program, EITC, CTC, the farm bill coming up, I can't claim to be an expert on all of these things, uh, but I can tell you that those are some of the examples of 
uh, bred working in our bipartisan efforts to make those things possible. Mm -hmm.